Welcome to our course, titled Introduction to Epigenetics. The materials for this first lesson will provide you with a general introduction to epigenetics, or above genetics, an important research area for molecular biology and important for analysis of molecular data types like ChIP-seq, BiSulfate-seq, and specialized RNA-seq. We hope to make these lessons informative for beginners and advanced users by touching on some important concepts, maybe without going into much detail where possible. As a quick guide, we will introduce important biological and analytical concepts related to the types of data used to analyze epigenetic variation. We will also introduce several commonly used tools for epigenetic data analysis. More in-depth study will be provided in subsequent lectures and reference materials included in the discussed projects and methods. Historically, the word epigenetics was used to describe events that could not be explained by genetic principles. Conrad Waddington, that lived between 1905 and 1975, who is given credit for coining the term, defined epigenetics as the branch of biology which studies the causal interaction between genes and their products, which bring the phenotype into being. His understanding of potential epigenetic changes are shown in these figures from his publication on the topic. As opposed to his predecessors, Waddington understood the limitations of possible epigenetic changes and related the landscape of this potential as a link between genes and the environment. Over the years, numerous biological phenomena, some considered bizarre and inexplicable, have been lumped into the category of epigenetics. These include seemingly unrelated processes such as paramutation in maize, position effect variegation in the fruit fly Drosophila, and imprinting of specific paternal or maternal loci in mammals. Although mysteries abound, the field is uncovering common molecular mechanisms underlying epigenetic phenomena that affect human health, our understanding of disease, and the fascinating inheritable traits that are not recorded in the DNA. Today we understand epigenetics as the study of mechanisms that cause changes in gene expression but that are not changes in the DNA sequence. These mechanisms include DNA methylation, histone modification, activity of non-coding RNAs such as microRNAs, and the effect of non-coding repeating regions in the DNA code. Before we go into the specifics of epigenetic variation or regulation, let's discuss the structure of DNA and how it is organized in eukaryotic cells. As you remember, the foundational understanding about phenotypes is that DNA codes for genes. Those genes are transcribed into RNA, which are then translated into proteins. However, these processes appear to be regulated by a variety of mechanisms that are not directly recorded in the actual code of DNA. In fact, individuals and members of different species can have similar DNA, like twins, or many conserved genes, like humans and monkeys. But significant phenotypic variation can be easily observed. That is the result of epigenetic changes that are either established and passed through generations or acquired and lost throughout the organism's lifetime. The eukaryotic cell has a nucleus that contains tightly packaged DNA folded into structures that we all know as chromosomes. These are packaged together by the way of chromatin, protein complexes that the DNA is wrapped around. On these images you can see how the DNA string has small bumps or beads. These visible beads are called histones. When these beads were originally discovered, scientists first confused them with genes, until eventually it was proven that the string-like structures actually contain the genetic code. Histones can be either grouped together, forming lumps of DNA, or as we can see in the picture on the right, relaxed and spread out. The changes in the way DNA is packaged is used for cell division when whole chromosomes need to be moved around, or to regulate what code is more or less accessible for transcription. The regulation of DNA compactness is regulated in several ways. One of these is DNA methylation. Cytosine, which is one of the amino acids, can be modified by a methyl group, CH3, attached by a specialized protein called DNA methyltransferase. 
In the first minutes of life, when we are composed of a single cell, this epigenetic information has been wiped clean. In the fertilized egg, the methyl groups have been removed and, even, and every gene is like all the others. Through the process of cell differentiation, DNA methyl transferases add methyl groups to genes, shutting off some and activating others. When a cell divides, the epigenetic information must be transmitted to each of the new cells. A different DNA methyl transferase, DNMT1, adds the proper methyl groups to these DNA strands as it is replicated. The information is propagated in a tricky way. Methyl groups are almost always added to cytosine bases with these sequences CG and GC. Notice that both strands have a cytosine. So in a methylated region of DNA, both strands will have a methyl group. When the DNA is replicated, each of the new DNA double helices will have one old strand complete with methyl groups and one strand which is not methylated. So DNMT1 just needs to look for CG base steps where only one strand has a methyl group. The basic repeating unit of chromatin is the nucleosome in which 146 base pairs of DNA wraps around an octamer of core histones consisting of pairs of H3, H4, H2A, and H2B. In terminal tails of histones protrude out of the nucleosome and are subject to a variety of post-translational modifications such as acetylation, phosphorylation, ubiquitylation, and lysine and arginine methylation. Acetylation was the first of these modifications to be linked with active transcription, and subsequently phosphorylation of histone H3 was found to cooperate with acetylation in translational activation. Some histone methylation events have also been associated with transcription activation and others with gene silencing. One important aspect of histones is that they can be changed to alter how much packing the DNA is capable of. There are several modifications that affect how well DNA is packaged. The basic regulation is done via groups of atoms that are at the ends of histones. These can be of several types and will have a positive or negative charge that either attract them together or force them apart. The DNA region that is wrapped around the histones can be more or less accessible, causing variation in gene expression. Histone proteins or nucleosomes undergo a host of different post-translational modifications including phosphorylation, acetylation, and methylation which have profound effects on the remodeling of chromatin. Histone modifications can function either individually or combinatorially to govern such processes as transcription, replication, DNA repair, and apoptosis. Methyl groups of atoms increase packing and acetyl group decreases packing. Also, phosphoryl group can be attached to the histones and cause a decrease in packing. These groups of atoms are attached to various types of histones at various locations. As the DNA is wrapped around the histones and can be more or less accessible, various positions of the DNA are affected. These include the promoter region, transcription start sites, and the introns and exons of genes. Each one of these elements can have a significant effect on the level of gene expression, on alternative splicing, as well as other downstream regulation of pathways. The size of the region and its location are both important. It turns out that different histone modifications are associated with specific widths and profiles of peaks that can be detected in ChIP-seq data. So how can we study chromatin changes and histone modification? Chromatin immunoprecipitation, or ChIP-seq, uses antibodies designed to bind to specific proteins of interest. POIs. These can be histones or other complexes attached to the DNA. The antibodies bind to proteins, thus helping cut out the portions of DNA that we would like to select for sequencing. Then, the antibodies and proteins are removed from DNA and libraries for sequencing are produced. The whole process looks the following. DNA and protein of interests are selected and antibodies are designed. Fragmented DNA helps select those areas that have proteins attached to them. Antibodies are then attached to the proteins of interest and those sections are selected. 
Then the DNA is released and sequencing libraries are prepared. After sequencing, we analyze the data for peaks, looking for specific patterns that are associated with different histone modifications and the openness or closedness of DNA. The major goal of the ChIP-seq analysis of signal distribution is to detect genome fragments that are enriched with upregulated signals. These fragments could be transcription factor binding sites, chromatin remodeling, or genome transcription events. The main algorithmic challenge here is to detect accurately short and long upregulated genome fragments generating a whole genome landscape for the signal. Probably the most discussed issue in ChIP-seq experiments is the best method to find true peaks in the data. A peak is a site where multiple reads have mapped and produced a pileup. Chip sequencing is most often performed with single end reads, and chip fragments are sequenced from their five prime ends only. This creates two distinct peaks, one in each strand with the binding site falling in the middle of these peaks. The distance from the middle of the peaks to the binding site is often referred to as the shift. Chipsy can be used to study histone modifications and the regions that are affected by histone methylation or acetylation. But the DNA methylation has to be studied using a different method called bisulfate sequencing. This method looks for methylated cytosines across the whole DNA. One of the major challenges in analyzing whole genome bisulfate sequencing data is related to the library preparation step. Cytosines on both strands of the DNA can be methylated. When the strands are separated, bisulfate conversion changes the non-methylated cytosines to uracil. Methyl groups protect the methylated cytosines, so they are not affected. During the subsequent PCR amplification step, uracil that appears from bisulfate conversion will be transformed into thymine. Thus, a triple conversion between amino acids occurs at the analytical challenge is to accurately map reads to their original location, differentiating between conversions that happened as a result of bisulfate conversion of unmethylated cytosines and thymines that were a part of the original sequence. Since both strands of the DNA are sequenced, their complementarity can be leveraged to address this challenge. Comparing quality of mapping to the reference genome with potential changes of cytosines to uracil makes the analysis of such data computationally intensive and time-consuming. In our next lecture, we will discuss non-coding RNAs and their role in gene expression regulation and epigenetics.